Um, this, is, this next panel is going to be a discussion about how regulators look at fraud. And I want to thank David for his fine, fine presentation. I thought, I thought the comments you made, especially at the end about non-GAAP reporting, are particularly interesting. I know I have a recent example that I found about Apple Computer, and they recently um, reported non-GAAP revenues, and they were about two billion higher than GAAP revenues. And so the question is, uh, what are you doing with non-GAAP reporting? And so Apple was basically saying, we know that the revenue recognition rules are about to change, and so the number that we're reporting for non-GAAP purposes is what we would be reporting if the new rules were in place. Now, it managed to increase their revenues by two billion, but it also made me wonder what the other firms were, would have reported under non-GAAP revenue, yeah, what their numbers would have been. So is it earnings management, or is it just an attempt to sort of front run what they would have naturally been required to report? It's kind of interesting aside. What I want to do now, though, is I would like to introduce our panel, okay? And we have three regulators, one current regulator to my immediate left is Scott Bogus, and I'm sorry, Jonathan, yes, you're still a regulator as well, and, and Greg Jonas, um, who has recently left the PCOBs. I'll briefly introduce everybody. Scott is the deputy chief economist and the deputy director for the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis at the SEC. Um, among Scott's many roles is the one that I feel is primary responsibility, which is to basically head up the data analytic efforts at the SEC and it, with respect to how the economists are involved in those, those, those areas. Um, he also, so if you think about the economists and the role they have at the SEC, they work in two specific areas. One is rulemaking and doing economic analysis to support rulemaking. And the other is, I think, more support for enforcement and examination activities. And this would be where I think the data-driven efforts are really being used and hopefully coming to fruition. And we'll find a little bit more about some specifics related to accounting fraud in, in a panel this afternoon. But Scott will talk broadly, I think, this morning about what DIRA is doing with a number of its sort of, um, sort of detection programs. Um, prior to joining the SEC, um, Scott was actually on the faculty at Texas Tech, um, and bef before that, he was actually an electrical engineer and worked as an engineer um, for seven years before going back to getting his PhD at Arizona State. So Scott, thank you for agreeing to join us today. Right. Um, next to Scott is Greg Jonas. Uh, Greg was recently um, the director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the PCAOB, which looked at research risk assessment, data analysis, and data man and knowledge management. Prior to joining the PCAOB, Greg was the managing director in the equity research group at Morgan Stanley. Previously, he spent six years as a managing director at Moody's Investment Service. Prior to that, he spent 23 years at Arthur Anderson, um, began as a staff accountant, um, became partner, and then managing director of their professional standards group. Um, early in his, earlier in his career, he served as the executive director of the AIC, AICPA Special Committee on Financial Reporting, and um, has published quite widely in the, a number of research reports as well as articles on how to improve business reporting and measuring the quality of financial reporting. Um, as an Ohio State uh, undergrad, I will forgive the fact that he actually is a University of Michigan alumnus. Jonathan, I hold a, a little higher regard because Jonathan is an Ohio State grad, um, but got his PhD at University of Chicago. Uh, after leaving Chicago, went to SMU, as with the Cox School for a while, and then he joined the SEC. Um, worked at the SEC for, how long was it, John? 15 years. 15 years? 15 years. Um, he was the director of the SEC's short-lived Office of Risk Assessment, 
which was then folded into what was originally referred to as the Division of Risk Strategy and Financial Innovation, which I changed to the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis while I was there. <laughs> Biggest accomplishment? Yeah, that, that's my notable achievement as the director. That <laughs> <laughs> was a name change. <laughs> but Jonathan was my deputy um, while, while I, when I first started. He left um, the SEC to become the acting deputy director at the newly formed Office of Financial Research and now serves as the chief economist and executive vice president at FINRA. So. Um, I think we have a really interesting um, panel. Everybody is intimately involved in sort of some of the questions that I think are relevant to the, the conference today. So I thought I'd just lead off by noting that since each of our panelists have significant regulatory and industry experience dealing with the detection of bad actors across a number of different activities, but they, had, they face similar but really, I think, fundamentally different problems. And I was hoping you could provide the audience with a kind of a brief description of your organization, some of the problems you face with respect to fraudulent activities, and the approaches that each of you adopted um, to deal with them. So, Scott, I'm going to begin with you. And as you just heard from David, the SEC has an active program for detecting accounting fraud. In your role as an economist that basically leads this effort, uh, could you give us a little bit more of a description of what's going on? Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Craig, for the nice introduction, and also for the invitation to come out here to speak to uh, all of you. Uh, I'll just note that seeing this panel was, uh, for me, kind of a reminiscent of uh, my uh, past uh, career and that uh, two of the individuals sitting at this table responsible for major shifts, uh, for perhaps better or worse, I don't know, in uh, my roles and responsibilities. Um, Jonathan uh, made me the assistant director for corporate finance in the division uh, maybe six or seven years ago, and Craig uh, uh, made me become the director, uh, deputy director, uh, before he left a few years ago. So um, it's fun now to be sitting on this panel with them. Uh, what Craig has asked me to do, and I'm sitting on two panels today, and uh, the first panel will talk a little bit about data analytics generally at the commission, how it's used, and uh, in what capacity uh, we engage in it. Uh, and this afternoon, I'll talk more about uh, accounting fraud, specifically in a lot of the initiatives that Craig originally uh, uh, kicked off when uh, he was uh, the, uh, the director and chief economist uh, a few years ago. And uh, before I uh, start, let me just give you my disclaimer, because I am an active regulator. Everything I'm saying here is my own views. It's not that of the commission staff, uh, commissioners, or anybody else. Um, so this is my get out of jail card. Um, and, uh, and so what I, what I thought I would do is, so when, when Craig, right before he left, the last thing he did that wasn't quite complete before he left uh, back in 2000 and, when did you leave, 2014? Yes, 13? Okay. 14, I can't Oregon. remember. Uh, as he started more than anything. He started the Office of Risk Assessment, and then what he did is he said, you know, we have, we do policy work, we do enforcement work, and in between we do a lot of these risk detection, uh, misconduct detection work, and it's somewhat ad hoc, and he said, we're doing it in enough places, let's put it all under one umbrella, uh, and let's call it the Office of Risk Assessment. It's the third incarnation of the Office of Risk Assessment uh, at the agency, uh, but this one was not uh, meant to be, you know, the top of the agency uh, with a lot of profile outward facing. It was within the division, and let's just focus a lot of our initiatives. And in uh, doing this, you know, a, a part of the vision of putting this group together is identifying what exactly uh, are, uh, entail risk assessment activities, and it really can be broken into three buckets, and we don't touch all of them in DIRA uh, specifically or with the uh, same level of effort or, or vigor, but you can consider them really in three buckets, and the first is what you would think is uh, the bread and butter risk assessments, the identification of uh, misconduct, statutory uh, or rule violations and fraud, um, and as David mentioned in his talk, uh, you also have the review of issuer disclosures, and this too is risk assessment. It takes a little bit of a different flavor, uh, but this is all the divisions, not just division of corporation finance, but also investment management and trading markets. For the registrant space, they look to see what they're disclosing to make sure that they are uh, disclosures that investors or market participants can use to assess the underlying risks associated with those entities. Uh, it is actually, I, I also, as one of my roles, I sit on the what we call the TCR Oversight Board, uh, 
Uh, it's a tips, complaints, and referral system that Post made off that was meant to automate the tips and complaints coming in and be able to triage them and send them to the right places. Uh, and as part of that activity, I get to see what actually is valuable and not in terms of that process. And I will say that the disclosure review program in CorpFin generates some of the highest valued uh, referrals to enforcement. So um, they are actually very good at undercovering issues that they refer to enforcement and do on a frequent basis. So there is a strong connection there that uh, results in material um, actions uh, by enforcement. And the third area of risk assessment is somewhat unique uh, following the financial crisis, and that is uh, market uh, and uh, systemic risk. And this is aggregating the micro risks in the market up to the macro le level, whether it's uh, OTC derivatives or securitization. And uh, this is uh, uh, something that's also within the umbrella and things that we work with, with FSOC, Financial Stability Oversight Council, and also the international body, the Financial Stability Board. Uh, and so the, all of these risk assessment activities use the same underlying methods and techniques in many cases. And um, so there, there are um, uh, many connections in these distinct activities. Um, in terms of the approaches that we use, uh, uh, just very simply, I like to break it down into two types. There is probably one type of predictive analytics that most of us in this room are familiar with. Uh, it's the classical statistical uh, processes, left-hand side variables, right-hand side variables of uh, linear regression or early, or early scores regressions or other econometric techniques. We build parsimonious models to understand relations and try to understand causal uh, elements in those relations. And then there is the, um, I guess it's the computer science meets econometrics or statistics, and this is you know pattern detection, textual analytics, uh, machine learning. Uh, this is, we don't, we, I say the collective we, the community does not care about causality if butterflies in China are causing fraud in the US. It goes into a model. And this is an entirely new type of uh, risk analysis that's being done uh, in, the market, uh, in, in the markets and also at regulators. And we also have, are engaged uh, in those types of activities. So that's um, a relatively uh, new innovation within the past few years of how we're looking at risk assessment programs. Um, generally speaking, if you think about where risk assessment is done, uh, you, if you're an attorney, this is how you would view where risk assessment is done. Um, it's in according to whatever the acts are that have been written by Congress and have mandated uh, by statute uh, where the SEC uh, should in, uh, apply its efforts. So in funds, investment companies, uh, investment, man, uh, investment advised investment company acts of uh, uh, 1940. Uh, private funds, Form PF is a new source of information coming from unregistered entities uh, in the private, uh, in, uh, private fund, fund space, i.e. hedge funds since the Dodd-Frank Act. Public companies, the 33 and 34 Acts on registration reporting requirements. Uh, and broker-dealers also fall under the 34 Act. In each of these areas, we have a risk assessment program. DEER is involved in these risk assessment programs, and they're often jointly involved with other divisions or offices, whether it's enforcement, our inspections and examination offices or the mission policy divisions. Uh, everybody's engaged uh, in these uh, um, activities. And I'm just gonna roll back here uh, just to, and make one comment that I, uh, as I was listening to David's uh, uh, talk earlier, wanted to say. And uh, if you look at, um, I guess, uh, under the review and issuer disclosures uh, bullet, uh, there's a significant innovation that is taking place right now in our risk assessment activities. It's not based on models, but it's based on something called inline XBRL. If you're familiar with how we ingest information and data coming into the commission, in 2009, Chris Cox, then chair of the SEC, uh, promulgated some rules that mandated that public issuers report their information in machine-readable format. Uh, we just announced in the past month that these disclosures can now voluntarily be provided in an inline XBRO format, which takes the underlying data and it maps it straight into the HTML version of the document that you're reading online. And what this can do, and if you can go online and look at our inline viewer to see what this, what this looks like, it embeds information in the document as you read it, and you can actually embed analytics in the filing itself when you read it. And this is something that's going to really change the way a reviewer will look at a document, because if you're floating your mouse over liquidity in the management discussion analysis and analytics will show up at the same time and say, 
uh, the management is saying liquidity is fine, and then liquidity is in the bottom 10th uh, decile, uh, or the lowest decile amongst peer firms, then you can immediately see something that uh, isn't reconciled uh, with the underlying analytics. And so it's a very powerful tool. And Mary Jo, uh, Chair Mary Jo White, has announced that staff is looking at promulgating rules that would require this. And so, as in the past, if you've looked at how rulemaking occurs, if a voluntary uh, um, order comes out, then it's probably not too far behind that you'll see a rulemaking. Uh, so that's something uh, to, to look out for. Uh, and finally, uh, this is something when Craig started the Office of Risk Assessment, it was really a, if you build it, it will come uh, effort. And it didn't exactly work out that way. Uh, we built it, and it did not come. And we had a, we learned quite a bit in that pro, in the process of trying to figure out how do you get customers to come internally to use analytics. And this five-step process is not something we ever designed, but we learned uh, on the fly. And I thought I would just run through it really quickly. If you want to know how a, risk, a successful risk assessment data analytic program at the commission works, now, this is what it entails. It starts with, before you do anything analytic related, is having a quant, an economist, somebody with modeling skills, sit down with a market expert, somebody who knows the market, somebody who can read a document and say, there's something fishy here or not. And you get those two parties talking, and the first thing that you want them to do is map what this subject matter expert and the market knows into some sort of quantitative metrics that would represent numerically what they're observing. And can you get some disclosure document that maps into what they're seeing systematically so you can start doing peer reviews and peer analysis, regression analysis. Uh, and once you, once you have that mapping done, the third step is to build a model. So halfway in the process is the model development. That could be something like the accounting quality model. Once you have everybody in the room, they sit down and they start mapping left-hand, right-hand side variables to build this model. And then once you have the model outcome, you have to apply it. Somebody actually has to take this information and go off and do something with it and make an assessment of whether or not it works, whether it's part of our compliance uh, and examinations program, whether it's enforcement, whether it's uh, uh, one of the mission policy divisions, corporate finance, investment management, trading markets. Somebody has to go out and see whether or not all of the, the rankings that were generated actually is manifest in what they're observing in the market. And once that is done, you, put the, you, you make an assessment, and that feedback goes right back to the beginning of the subject matter experts to see, did this actually work? So in the corporate issuer space and the broker-dealer space, these are two areas where we're now entering the fourth and third year of these programs, and that's exactly what's being done. It takes about an annual cycle to get through, and at the end of the year, we all get in a room, and we talk about what worked and what didn't and what needs to be changed uh, going into the next year. And so... Um, I'm going to stop there and uh, pass it on to, uh, Jonathan, the, the, to Jonathan, I guess, is next. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I thought I'd take a very quick second and um, tell you a little bit about FINRA because it may be an organization which you have less direct experience. I'll keep it brief so that we can get back to the focus of the conversation, which is the basically analytics in support of identifying fraud and regulators. Um, I would start with my own background. I was trained as a corporate finance economist. I am an accidental mar market microstructure economist at this point in my life. Um, and that will come out as my comments go on. So FINRA is an independent, non-governmental regulator with a mission of protecting investors and ensuring well-functioning markets. We're responsible for the oversight of almost all broker-dealers, basically any broker-dealer who faces the public in the United States. That's about 3,600 companies and about 640,000 individuals. Um, we do it by establishing our own rules, enforcing our own rules, but we also have delegated authority for SEC rules and for federal securities law. In fact, while we're overseen by the, uh, by the SEC, um, the SEC generally defers to us as the primary inspector examiner of broker-dealers. 
So the size of FINRA is about, it's, it's over 3,000 individuals, so it's about the same order of magnitude as the SEC. And like the SEC, we have offices nationwide, and it's a combination of lawyers, examiners, we have some accountants, um, we have a lot of IT people. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, but, our, but our scope is a little bit narrower. So we examine, surveil, and enforce for a range of prudential and market conduct kinds of issues. So these would include risk management in the large firms, capital, um, at the largest broker dealers. We monitor markets for a wide range of potentially manipulative practices, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And we examine for a lot of customer abuse by registered persons. All right, so that's, that's the sales pitch. So I would start with talking about analytics with an observation. Um, I think we can all think of instances where the leader, often a political leader, declares victory uh, on an issue, maybe on a battleship, maybe in front of a, um, you know, a, a large press conference, um, and without naming any of the, you know, implicating any of the agencies uh, that are represented here or for whom I have worked, uh, I would say about six or seven years ago, there was a lot of declaration of victory in the sense that now all regulators, particularly surveillers, were data driven. Unfortunately, at the time that those declarations of victory were made, most regulators did not have an infrastructure to do the kind of analytics to support the notion of truly being data driven. And I think what you have here at this table are people who have worked for a lot of years behind those kinds of, of strong public statements to build the infrastructure, hire the people, build the models, get the data in shape to start to make a reality of those claims. And I think it's actually a testament to the regulatory authorities um, that they actually were willing to let us do this because there have been lots of other instances where victory is declared and then they've moved on to whatever the next problem in the press is. So, so let me start. While you will hear a combination of, let's call it a little bit of, of boasting of all the things that we've done, um, behind it is an immense amount of work, but also the notion that there's still a lot to be done. There is massive amounts of information that have been collected for many years, none of it collected, with the intent to be used in an analytic form. The SEC, as David mentioned, is, is primarily a disclosure agency, and hence didn't view the information coming in as an asset. It was a pass-through agency. Why is it that electronic data, electronic data, for many years at the SEC was a PDF, which is really just electronic paper? It is only because there's been some perseverance in the use of analytics that we've been able to change how our organizations do it. And it's because of people like David who, who are both interested you know, in, in senior leadership positions um, and willing to, to make the commitment of time and money, which, is, which are both scarce resources, positions and money, scarce resources in government. So at FINRA, I'll, I'll argue that what we do is really two different kinds of, of analytics around fraud, or um, I guess more generally, it's, it's uh, customer abuse or, or uh, malpractice, right? Um, not all of it is fraud. One large area is around markets activities, right? We take in, um, Every, for every broker-dealer, we take in every order, every cancellation, every amendation, every execution. We also take in from the exchanges their audit books for about 99% of the, of, of the exchanges in the United States. So as a result, we have the most complete picture of what's happening. We take about 65% of the activity in the um, in the options space as well. To give you an idea of the order of magnitude, in a typical month, just in equities, we take in about 
79 to 80 billion events. We filter those events on a daily basis and try to identify patterns that may be associated with fraud or manipulative activity. So what are the kinds of things that we're going to do? So these are some examples. Wash trades, uh, layering and spoofing, which is effectively baiting orders in, uh, intended to get another uh, algorithm to think that, the, that there's an order imbalance and so that they'll come in and try and trade, and then you'll take the opposite side and pick them off. Um, aggressive algorithms, which are trying to narrow the NBBO, and then you tie that with a wash sale. Front running. Um, there, are, there are all these different kinds of activities. The problem, of course, is identification. And whether you're using the kind of machine learning um, uh, techniques that Scott was talking about, or you're using uh, sort of more fundamental approaches, the, the, the problem is really sort of uh, type one and type two errors. So to give you an example, and I want to just make sure I get the numbers right. So our data in this, uh, in this, in this area goes about four years back. Um, and so if we focus just on layering and spoofing, uh, we generate about 4 million exceptions per month in layering in 6,000 unique QCIPs and about 1,000 exceptions per month in spoofing in 75 unique QCIPs. So obviously, you're not finding 4 million cases of, front, uh, of layering and spoofing in a month. The question is then, how do you use analytic techniques to go from these really large numbers to a set of cases that you can, you can demonstrate are really abusive? And that's, that's really both the art and science of the analytics. And we can talk more about this later. The other side of the house is on the, the sales practice side. So how do you identify in a risk framework, the set of brokers who are likely manipulating, uh, you know, accounts or abusing their, their customers. Uh, we use a wide variety of techniques, some of them predictive. One of the things that I would mention that, that I think is particularly interesting and effective are tribe analyses. So, um, you know, it's all within the context of, of culture. You see a lot of bad brokers in a particular firm. The firm gets uh, expelled, uh, you then look to see where the bad brokers went. Where do they recongregate at? Uh, or you start to look at brokers who work with brokers who have a predominant history of doing bad things. You can use really interesting analytics. Uh, now, they are predictive. And, and the, the last thing I'll say before I, before I stop is, um, while it's really important that we do this work, I think it's also important for this audience to understand that there are some natural limitations. So the one thing among the things that a decision maker in a regulatory body has problems with is a black box where they don't understand the process by which an outcome is derived. Right? And particularly a process that has type 1 and type 2 ter errors in it. So, it's very difficult to say, I've got, this, I've got this machine learning tool, and it says, these guys over here are the really bad guys. And the, the, the decision maker will say, that's great, but now prove it. Now do more. All of these tools have to be viewed as part of um, a, a toolkit that a regulator has that's solving not only the economic problem, but the political and legal problems as well. And that's really sort of the, the challenge and, and part of what makes our jobs really, really, really interesting. I'll stop there. So Greg, we'll turn to you. Um, basically, I'd like you to handle the same basic question the other two panelists, but I'd like to throw a couple extra items on, on your plate. Um, in addition to talking a little bit about the analytic efforts at the PCOB, I wonder if you could possibly focus on why cooking the books has proven so difficult to kill and costly to address. And maybe secondly, why do you think external auditors are so bad at detecting and eradicating earnings management? So how is the play, Mrs. When uh, Craig uh, called me to invite me to serve on this panel, I was quick to remind him that I didn't consider myself an expert in fraud. 
And Craig said, well, that's curious, Greg, because you've been present for most of the biggest corporate frauds in American history, Enron and <laughs> WorldCom at Arthur Anderson, subprime mortgage crisis at Moody's, Madoff at the PCAOB. He said, a guy like you who's majored in failure has all the credentials you need to <laughs> serve in this family. A few words about the PCAOB uh, and its role. It, it has no direct role, uh, I believe, in addressing uh, cooking the books. Uh, it faces audit firms, not corporate issuers, and its role is to improve audit quality, not corporate financial reporting quality. Even the board's inspection division does not evaluate financial reporting when it inspects the work of audit firms. Anything coming to the board's attention about bad corporate reporting, it refers to the audit firm and to the SEC rather than with corporate issuers. And the, and the number of times that the inspection division has found what it believes to be uh, aggressive uh, accounting is actually very, very few cases. That said, the board has an obvious powerful indirect role in addressing fraud, and I think it has that indirect role in three respects. First, it writes the rules for how external auditors should think about fraud when designing their audit tests and evaluating the results. And it also writes the rules for audit firms' systems of quality, that is, how firms should manage themselves, what it calls its QC standard. Uh, a driver of the environment in which engagement teams operate, obviously, including their incentives uh, to detect bookkeeping. And we'll talk in just a minute about why I think auditors are historically not very good at, uh, at detecting fraud. Uh, the second powerful indirect uh, role of the PCOB uh, is its inspection division can inspect the work of auditors for compliance with fraud-related standards. And it does uh, through its inspection division do this. Uh, it is a frequent critic of firms. Uh, it's, uh, for the most part, quite public about what the board thinks about uh, audit quality in this area. And I think that has had an important motivational effects on the firm to raise their game. And we'll talk in a little bit about what firms are doing uh, to raise their games in fraud prevention and detection. And the third thing the board has uh, as an indirect effect is through its enforcement division uh, bringing uh, disciplinary action against auditors who fail to meet uh, auditing standards related to, to fraud, uh, particularly in cases where the auditor ignored or rationalized away uh, warning signs of bookkeeping. And if you look at uh, some of the board's cases and many of the SEC's enforcement cases, that's exactly what they're focusing on. It's, it's not cases where the auditor just wholesale missed a fraud, didn't even know about it. It's where the auditor had their hands on the issue of the fraud and uh, dismissed it, got talked out of it, rationalized it uh, away. So that's the PCAOB's uh, role. So why is it that cooking the books has proven to be so very difficult to kill? Uh, and I think it's really shockingly simple. And that is, corporate reporting is riddled with a fundamental conflict of interest. Now, in countless areas of human endeavor, we carefully separate score making from score keeping. Examples include athletic competition of all type, our system of education, and our system of jurisprudence. In each case, the players in the game are separate from the scores of the game. Imagine a baseball game where the batter gets to call the balls and strikes. It would be laughable, right? But what we wouldn't dream about doing in sports or education or jurisprudence, uh, we wholeheartedly embrace in corporate reporting. There, we ask management and the board to be both score makers and score keepers. The conflict with management is particularly enormous. Their pay, their reputation, their self-respect, their role in the community is tightly tied to the success or failure of their company. Their huge incentive is for the company to win at all costs, uh, and if not in the marketplace, perhaps at least in the corporate scorecard. And further, having set the company's direction and strategy, management is inherently optimistic about the companies they manage. And that optimism creeps into the estimates and judgments inherent in financial reporting. Few hit the ball down the middle of the fairway, but skew it to conform to their optimistic view of the world. I read a great quote recently 
about fraud. It said, the challenge for capitalism is that things that breed trust also breed an environment for fraud. Corporate reporting, I am convinced, is generally not a story about bad actors. Rather, it's a story about conflicted actors who have the difficult task of writing their own report card, one that drives their fortune in position. With such a fundamental conflict of interest, the question isn't why we have fraudulent reporting, it's why we don't have more of it. The fact that cooking the books is not more widespread is a testament to the many band-aids that we've placed on a wounded system and the professionalism of many uh, corporate accountants and auditors. A couple comments on why it is that I think auditors struggle so in, uh, in detecting and preventing fraud at, uh, at their audit clients. Obviously, audit auditors are a key part of the band-aids that we've installed to address score-making and score-keeping conflicts. Unfortunately, uh, they've proven to be ineffective, as I mentioned. They rank well behind whistleblower programs, internal audit, short sellers, and the business press in servicing fraud at large public companies. Why? Well, part of the story is that the external auditor is conflicted, uh, not news to anyone here, because they're hired, compensated, and fired by management and the board, which are conflicted themselves. To keep favor with management, there's a strong incentive for the auditor to see the world through the same optimistic lens which management sees the world. I'm convinced it's not that auditors embrace cooking of the books. It's that they rationalize away the cooking to be an acceptable judgment or too small to matter. They often don't see cooking as cooking. The point about conflicts is illustrated by the fact that in the majority of book cooking, the auditors have touched the issue of the fraud. And too many times they don't pursue the warning signs or management talks them out of the problem. Rationalization is alive and well in corporate reporting and auditing. Now another part of the problem is the economics of auditing. Looking for fraud is an exercise in pursuing false positives. More often than not, the auditor doesn't find fraud. Thus, looking for fraud is often expensive without payback. And at a time when audit fees are under pressure, and today they're rising at a rate roughly about inflation, the auditor is unlikely to get paid for a hard, expensive look for fraud, particularly if they come up empty. The economic incentive is simply not to look hard. The third part of the issue is that external auditors are not well trained on forensics or on the pressures the market puts on management to achieve financial objectives which is where management will cook the books if they choose to do so. So in effect, the typical auditor is naive to the ways and pressures on those who may cook the books, and thus their efforts in fraud are too often unfocused and superficial. And finally, uh, giving the auditor some credit, is the fact that detecting cooking is often inherently tough. With cooking, management's intention is to deceive those in the game, including the auditors. Sometimes there's, sometimes there's collusion with third parties, which magnifies the deception. Even with the best of incentives and skills, detecting fraud is difficult. We'll talk in a little bit about what more folks might be able to do. Great. So I'm going to queue up a, a few questions. And the first one, I'll direct uh, all three panel members if you'd, if, and respond if you'd like to. But um, in some of David's remarks, he talked about the relatively low rate of accounting fraud cases that have taken place over the past 10 to 15 years. Um, and part of the explanation that he offered was sort of mandatory rules like Sarbanes-Oxley and certification and the effect that might have on reducing sort of accounting fraud. One of the things that I wanted to cue up here is, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the efforts that we've taken as regulators to detect and go after fraud. Do you think that this has a deterrent effect? And do you think that the deterrent effect is something that's effective? That's, good. No, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so I'm going to not uh, respond to whether I think um, uh, there's a deterrent effect, because I honestly don't know. I don't even know how you measure that. Um, but I, I do want to point out one observation that we've looked at quite extensively and have been criticized at the SEC uh, about, uh, and the reason the Jobs Act was created is on capital formation, 
Uh, one of the, op if you look at post SOX, what has happened to public issuers is they've gotten much bigger, they've gotten much more complicated, and smaller companies are harder to find. We went from 12,000 issuers at the time of SOX to less than 8,000 today. And I think what has happened is the quality knob on venture reporting has increased, and as a result, the fixed cost of doing so has pushed smaller companies out of uh, public reporting, and this has caused the problem of how do you raise capital and how do you go public, and now we have this whole idea of an IPO on-ramp and how do we uh, get smaller companies to get into the reporting regime, and so you have to be careful what you wish for, and sometimes people have asked me the question of how many public companies, you know, should there be? And it's, you know, it's not a question you should ask. It's just how, what level of quality do you want to see in the market? And that's going to drive, um, you know, the number of public companies that will exist. But uh, let me just uh, maybe just make one other comment um, uh, going back to my role sitting on the TCR Oversight Board is that if you look at the tips and complaints that come in, they're relatively monotonic over time. Um, and they're just, which would be indicative of just there being a baseline level of issues and fraud in the market. And so that begs the question of, you know, does a fraud actually, the level of it change over time or the driving factors? But again, I think this is a latent variable that I'm not aware that it's easy to measure. So um, I don't know if Greg or um, Jonathan have a view. So I'm going to answer the question a little differently, you know. If you think about sort of the basic economic theories around um, uh, fines as a deterrent, uh, the theory sort of always starts with the very basic math that the size of the, in order for it to be an effective deterrent, the size of the penalty has to be grossed up for the probability of being identified. And so if you do a million dollars worth of damage and there's only one third chance of being caught in any fraud, you want to have a $3 million penalty. Otherwise, the economics suggest that you'll continue to do it. Right? That's real simple math. I can do it. Um, the problem, of course, nobody knows what that probability is. But the point I want to make is that the purpose of fines may, there are multiple purposes for fines. Right? So the notion of recompense to harmed investors or harmed parties is very different than the notion of the fine as a deterrent. It, it, it requires a different order of magnitude. And particularly in a world where you happen to, if you happen to be lucky enough to get the windfall of having been able to sell a stock during a fraud, you get to keep it, right? You, you don't ever have to get that, give that back. The size of the pool that's available to recompense is never equal to the size of the, of the harm that's being done to the public. Further, one of the things that you will hear in conversation is that the regulator generally does not believe that it is its duty in, in determining the fraud. In fact, it's quite opposite. It does not want to bankrupt an, a firm for purposes of, of uh, getting the right fine number. So you have competing demands on the regulator. What's the purpose of, of the fine? And what are the, let's call it, economic implications of fining at, let's, at, at, a, at a level that might be a deterrent? So I think you have to think about fines and penalties as um, partial deterrents only. Uh, because I don't think it's, uh, I don't think a regulator is capable of, of imposing fine levels that would be um, strictly deterrent in, in a pure economic sense. Uh, I very much agreed with David's uh, list that he put up. Uh, I think he had seven, eight items on it that, uh, that were possible reasons why uh, we have less cooking of the books today than we uh, did 15 years ago. Uh, the one that I have particular personal experience with and was a game changer in terms of aligning incentives in the, more in the favor of the public interest uh, is the role of the PCOB's inspection division, uh, which was a game changer for audit partners. Uh, now there is a realistic chance that very shortly after they finish an audit, people will come in who are quite talented at looking at the quality of that work and be very critical about that work. 
And if they criticize that work, all the firms have put in place now direct uh, payment consequences, uh, assignment consequences, promotion or demotion consequences to those findings. And so the time between a bad audit and a direct consequence to an audit partner's future is now measured in about 18 months. And that is a complete game changer in incentives. It has riveted the firms. It's got everybody's attention. Um, I think right now every firm is working very hard to manage its regulatory risk. Audit partners are working very hard to raise their game in the name of managing regulatory risk. That should not be confused for a passionate desire to compete and win in the marketplace based on quality. I think that's the ultimate goal. But I think we have certainly moved, the PCOB as a regulator has moved the profession uh, from being minimalist auditors 15 years ago to being very interested in managing their regulatory risk today. If we can move the incentive system further to a passionate competition based on quality, I think we will uh, have uh, arrived. Um, interestingly, um, I, um, I've always been curious about fines uh, as a deterrent effect uh, in the marketplace because the fines are often lev leveled uh, at the companies. And so the shareholders suffer first by the fraud, and they suffer again based on the fine, as if the shareholders are the people who have done the crime. Uh, I think if we're going to bankrupt anybody with a fine, it ought to be the management who cooked the books. They should be bankrupt. They should be in jail. I just never understood the logic of leveling billion-dollar fines against, against the company as if the company sinned. Uh, the company usually did not. So I think that the incentive system is, uh, is much better today than it was. Uh, but um, I think I would just note in closing that I think we have continued to put Band-Aids on a system that has got this fundamental conflict on it. Uh, it's interesting that we never consider the possibility of actually dealing with the conflict directly by separating score making from score keeping like we do elsewhere in human endeavor. We continue to plop on Band-Aids, which arguably are far more expensive and far directly and indirectly impactful instead of directing the problem itself. Craig? Can, can I just add one thing? So, so when I, you know, I think this notion of the scorekeeping versus uh, uh, score making is, is an important one. Um, I'd say in our space, if you look at it, just the, the kind of activity that I was talking about in terms of market activity, one of the things that's important to note is that we're actually looking for fraud in activity, not in reporting. And in part, that's because there's a, you know, you've got a two-sided two reporting system, right? So each party is reporting on their own, but uh, because it's a zero-sum game, that, that enforces some of it. You also have clearance and settlement. But the fact that you have um, uh, separation, in this case, between activity and reporting doesn't mean that, that there isn't a lot of fraud that, that occurs as well. And so it's, it's, it's a start, but it's, it's probably not enough on its own. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. And Jonathan, Scott, this may be more relevant to, to you, but when I was at the SEC and I would frequently make, uh, in my public remarks, I would talk about things like the accounting quality model. And almost inevitably, when it got to the Q&A session, someone in the audience would ask if I would be willing to discuss the factors that were embedded in the model and in a sense, tell the public what the secret sauce was that was being used to detect earnings management. And I wondered if I could get your views on whether that is something that is, should be done or whether it's a proprietary model that should be basically kept secret or kept under wraps. Um. Let me reiterate that um, these are my views, not the views of the commission. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is a, an open question that the SEC has not yet had to answer because the opportunity to have to answer has not yet come up. Um, but it is something that we've thought about, and there are really two camps. One is if you know how to find fraud, don't say anything because the fraudsters will then be more creative in avoiding it. 
Uh, on the other side, and this is a very uh, valid uh, uh, concerning question amongst uh, regulated entities, is they have compliance programs and they want to understand how to make them stronger and build them, and if they know what regulators are looking at, they can build stronger programs. Uh, it's particularly true in the broker-dealer and the investment advisor investment company space, uh, particularly when you know, the fixed costs of compliance are high and many funds don't have resources, a lot of resources to do it, they need help. And so this question comes up frequently whenever I'm talking to those communities. And I think the answer ultimately is going to lie in, you know, what can you talk about uh, a detection model, a fraud detection model, a misconduct detection model, or a compliance detection model uh, that can't be gamed by the system. And so we've openly said, if you change your auditor, uh, that is a risk factor. That is not something that you can game. If you don't, in fact, change your auditor, that may actually be good in helping detect problems at the firm. Or if you do change it, then you ask the question, well, why did you change your auditor? There are good reasons, there are bad reasons, and you know which of the two is it? And so disclosing f risk factors that are less gameable seems entirely appropriate. Uh, some of the risk factors that are softer or um, easy, easier to manage based on how an issuer discloses information. And I'll say one area of that is text analytics. Um, and what you pull out of a narrative disclosure and how somebody says something. Uh, I will just say that uh, the use of text analytics and its ability to detect misconduct is real. Uh, we are using it at the SEC, and some of the benchmarking that we've done is, you know, some of our text analytic models can predict uh, the likelihood, at least historically backtesting, of uh, misconduct in certain issuers uh, eight times better than random selection. And so that's really significant uh, ability to uh, detect uh, nefarious behavior or uh, compliance issues. Um, but that's really easy to game if you tell somebody how you're doing that because you just change the way you order your words on the page. Uh, so that's um, something that I think would be less likely to be disclosed. So long before there were any analytics, there was always a model um, on how an enforcement agency decides what its priorities are. Uh, that model may be as simple as looking at what the press clippings say, um, but it's a model nonetheless. And it's very true that there are a lot of people um, in the private sector who spend time trying to figure out, to infer from public pieces of information what the regulators um, priorities are, or what the enforcers' priorities are, or what their triggers are. Um, and so <clears throat> the problem isn't a new one. It's as the models have become more defined, people want more defined information uh, to try and figure out, either for compliance purposes or avoidance. And so I think what the regulator needs to do is find some middle ground where they can help compliance folks and firms understand what's important in terms of their own programs without necessarily giving all the details, in part because the way market activity occurs changes constantly. Right? And so a lot of the continual improvement that we have to do is even once we have a model set, we have to be constantly looking to see if behaviors change in ways that people achieve the same economic ends in different ways. The way that FINRA has dealt with this recently is we started to give firms report cards. So what we do is we show firms their exceptions relative to their peers. We don't tell them how we came up with those exceptions, the rules that generate those exceptions. As I said, we take in, in the equity space, immense amount of data. We run 50 to 60 uh, sets of, of uh, queries against the data on a nightly basis to identify activity that seems to be consistent with behavior that might be um, fraudulent or, or inappropriate. So I think there are ways that regulators can help um, firms better understand what kind of behavior is acceptable without giving the model characteristics. There is only one place, to my knowledge, where the PCAOB uses uh, a model looking at corporate reporting, not, I'm not talking about audit firms, I'm talking about issuers, uh, and that is where it decides where to go inspect. And what it does is it looks at what it believes to be risky corporate reporting, marries that up with what it believes to be risky statistics related to firms, offices, or particular partners. It marries those up and to try to identify the risky places to go inspect. It's a risk-based inspection program, not 
a random-based uh, inspection program. Uh, and so it does have a model. Uh, the firms know it, but they don't know what the model is. Uh, and I would not be a fan of making the model public because I think it is in the public interest for the firms to not know where the inspectors are going to go because that's an incentive to try to do uniformly high-quality auditing and not just high-quality auditing in the particular places where the regulator is likely to look. And so I'll add my two cents to this conversation. And one of the reasons why we originally developed the accounting quality model at the SEC is not to be used as a fraud detection tool, but to be designed to actually identify areas in financial statements that the review teams in corporate finance should be aware of before they actually began the review process. And so and that's why it's called the accounting quality model, not the accounting fraud model. Right? And the idea here was if there are ways that firms are manipulating performance, it would be useful for these review teams to actually have some you know, sort of signal before they begin the review. And so my, so when my public remarks, I fundamentally moved. Initially, I was under the view, a lot like Greg's, that this is the secret sauce, that you don't want to let people know this is what we're looking at. But I, by the time I was ready to leave and return to academia, I completely changed my views. And I felt that it should be something that filers are aware of. These are standard ways that firms use to cook their books. I didn't see that there was anything wrong with letting firms know exactly what the SEC was looking at. I find Scott's discussion about text analytics to be an exception to how I would think about it. I think that's a really valid point. But in my view, if there are standard ways that firms use to cook the books and you can figure those out, if this model deters that type of activity, that's beneficial to investors. And what it means is that if you still want to cook your books, you have to go to ever more costly, harder to pull off methods to try and achieve the same objectives. Because let's face it, you're going to take the low hanging fruit first, which are the standard methods of sort of managing earnings. And to continue to do this, it becomes harder and harder. And the models have to be adaptive, they have to change over time and that to, to basically deter, detect new methods. Of so if, if we get rid of all the fraud, how are we going to calibrate our models? <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so yes, I'd like to open it up for Q&A, back in the back. But with the new techniques, it's very hard to understand where the score is coming from. So uh, does that make the, the question moot as to what is the uh, uh, secret sauce? And, and how do you communicate both internally and externally around a number that is very hard to understand uh, just by looking at it? You know, when, so machine learning was rather new to me until about 2000. 14, uh, and it's really, at least me personally, given me a lot of, um, uh, uh, it's been very difficult to wrap my hands around because I was trained as a PhD, as an academic, that you don't build a, law, a model unless there's some sort of causal inference associated with it, and you build models that are par parsimonious, and uh, you're careful in, your, in, in how you construct them, and all of a sudden computer science meets statistics, and we have, you know, these neural networks that are detecting fraud and we don't know why it ex you know the fraud exists but we just know it's there and that's fine um, I think text analytics is where I found com personally found common ground with these uh, um, uh, techniques uh, like LDA uh, methods of um, detecting patterns and so there you can at least uh, uh, you know, do topic modeling or things that separate and distinguish without knowing exactly why. It's just uh, uh, converting words to numbers and looking for differences in ways that uh, there is no inference. But when you look at the results, you can start seeing the, how the patterns uh, uh, correspond to 
observed behaviors. And I think that's the one area of machine learning that I think is going to gain a lot of traction. But some of the other areas, I, I you know, me personally, I, uh, I really struggle with uh, understanding how to, uh, to use in a way that particularly you have to have a user of the model. And if you go to an enforcement attorney and explain why you should be looking at something and you can't yourself understand what's in that block box, it's almost a hopeless task to get them to actually do something with that information. So it's an excellent question. So I think um, that part of the, I think that David's eight item list, um, audit committees was on there. I think uh, the fact that we have better audit committees today than we did uh, has been a causal factor in having reduced cooking of the books. Uh, I think a lot of big company audit committees these days are uh, a lot better than they were, but I think there's a bunch of audit committees that are still relatively weak. But where I've seen strong audit, audit committees, uh, it really boils down to the following, is a best practice, I think, fraud deterrent. And that is the head of the audit committee sits down with the CEO and the CFO and says, if I ever catch you playing games with these books, I'm going to do everything I can to destroy your career. And then meets privately with the audit partner and says, if I ever find out that you were aware of anything, that you had a concern, that you did not bring to my attention immediately, I'm going to do everything I can to destroy your career. Do we have an understanding? In effect, the audit committee, they were given by the law the right to hire, fire, and compensate the auditor. They need to act like they are hiring, firing, and compensating the auditor. And I think worst practice audit committee performance is fundamentally delegating to management the oversight of the auditor. And that is a recipe for disaster. So, so after, after sitting through the first panel discussion and the keynote speech, I, I worry a little bit about to, you know, to what extent I can trust the financial accounting data. That's extremely problematic for me because I teach financial accounting and financial system analysis and valuation. So how pervasive do you think earnings management is? And how pervasive do you think corporate fraud is? And whether you know, the two are the same in your mind? I'm going to answer a different question, which is um, <laughs> I, I think that generally, as researchers, we take the data as given and don't spend enough time understanding the processes that generate them and the quality of the inherent data. Um, and I think that quite often, I mean, one of the reasons we tend to mine in literature the same data is because somebody else has already figured out sort of some of the problems. But every once in a while, there's a paper that shows um, that the way that a particular data service deals with uh, um, uh, splits ends up, you know, uh, stock price splitting, uh, stock splitting um, affects the way that, you know, you lose precision in the pricing and if you try and go backwards, all of a sudden all your, your results are biased. Um, for us, we are constantly trying to use new data that haven't been used for, for cross-sectional and, and panel purposes. Um, and my staff is under very clear direction that before we do any analysis, we do a lot of investigation into the data quality, its provenance, um, and ensure that we can actually rely on the, uh, you know, the uh, the inferences that we get from our studies. And, and I would encourage researchers generally to, to spend a little bit more time on that issue. Um, sorry, F for a long time. So, so after Enron, there was a blue ribbon panel set up. Actually, Zavano was one of the instigators of this, about how to rethink the audit process, in part, to detect frauds and so on. And it struck me that, that the only answer is to change what auditing is doing, changing the audit report in the following senses. We, we are talking about, and what 
the SEC is focused on is compliance with GAAP. If we change that to a fair presentation of the financial performance and position of the firm, all of this changes and actually the kind of earnings management type fraud becomes much more or the focus of attention and potentially more likely to be caught. I would be surprised if you could um, overcome the problem of what you're calling fraud if you still focus on compliance with a set of rules. And this non-gap, I agree. There are issues if you're trying to analyze and invest in firms, you don't want to use some of the gap measures. You make adjustments all the time. So to the extent you're trying to reflect it, and your Apple example's perfect. If we've changed an accounting rule, why should people, because arguably it's gonna improve the disclosure for investors or whoever the, the users are, why wouldn't you change it immediately if you have the ability internally to do so? And so, so we, we, my question really is, if we change that report, okay, we change the focus of what we're doing, do you think that would help the problem, address the problem? Let me take kind of a slightly different shot at this, and it's something you're probably a little bit aware of, right? And so, Scott, one of the issues you have is data quality. Jonathan talked about how do you get good data, right? And the SEC has been requiring firms to submit XBRL to, as part of, along with their 10K for a long time. And Scott mentioned the, the voluntary compliance program with a new version of XBRL called Inline XBRL, which effectively forces firms that adopt this standard to make sure that the numbers that they're reporting for purposes of meeting the XBRL mandate are going to map directly into what's being reported in the financial statements. And so there's a voluntary program. My understanding is that only four firms have actually complied with the voluntary XBRL standard. So it, not a lot of firms are willing to do things that at some level should improve the quality of the data that's being reported into the regulator. And so as a pilot sort of precursor to a mandatory rulemaking, XPRL just makes, a, inline makes a lot of sense to me. It won't change your ability to cook books, but it will force you to clean up your act a little bit with some common reporting errors that occur in XPRL. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, <clears throat> data quality with XBRL is, there's been a lot of reluctance for people to report XBRL in a way that's actually usable. The amount of extensions and customization of the reporting makes it very difficult to use. Uh, and there's been a lot of um, slowness in the uptake of uh, cleaning up the XBRL data. And so one of the initiatives in making it in line is if, if a number you're reporting in your HTML document and uh, your filing is different than, you know, not tagged accordingly, then that that is, you know, a problem. Uh, but, you know, most of the data that we use uh, to analyze firms gets standardized through S&P or Joint and Reuters or some other data aggregator. It's only a subset of the information that's actually uh, given. If you want to get good information from the footnotes, you have to hand collect it or use some, some sort of method to get it. Uh, and that's what inline XBRL is going to change completely. Uh, and as that data gets better and as companies are forced to uh, put more effort in making that information available in a standardized format, and it does require the SEC to push the standardization, I think that's really going to drive a lot of the uh, answers to the questions that are asking on um, uh, how usable it is. And just, you know, going back to my, you know, finance trading days, you know, I was always taught in finance that we don't care about the accounting numbers. We just want to convert it to free cash flows. Uh, and so it's always a, uh, a way to, you know, how do you translate what's reported in the balance sheet income statement and so forth into something that you can actually uh, provide the discounting cash flow model to. So anything that gets you closer to that, I think enhances your ability to, um, you know, place a valuation on uh, corporate issuers. Great. Yeah. We're at 1030, so. Yeah, I think one more question. One more question. Savannah's been waiting for a while. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to go back to our opening remarks, and um, uh, I've been reflecting on what Greg said, and so I'm going to take the bait. And he seems to think that our system of financial reporting where management is responsible for the financial re for running the company and 
also for financial reporting is fatally flawed. So I'd just like to ask Greg what, what he has as the alternative. Uh, the alternative is, is to separate score making from scorekeeping um, by saying that the role of the independent public accountant is not to audit the books but to keep the books. And they become asserters rather than attesters to what conflicted management is asserting. And they are incented solely to keep good books. They should be compensated solely based on the results. If there's a restatement of the books, there should be clawback provisions uh, into the compensation of the auditor in a major way. I have a question. Have you ever talked to auditors about that? I mean, would they, on the one hand, I imagine they would just see the dollar sign. <laughs> <laughs> but, seriously, have, what did they, have you ever talked to any auditors about that? Like, what do they think of that? Yeah, it, it stands absolutely no chance of <laughs> being it, it isn't because of auditors. It's, it's because there's such entrenchment uh, by management and boards into the God-given right of writing their own report card that no one would even think of doing what we do in sports, in, in uh, education, and in jurisprudence. It's, it's laughed at, but it seems to me it's, it's the only way to deal at the root cause of the issue. But it stands zero chance. Great. Well, I would like to thank our panelists today uh, for graciously agreeing to spare some of your time from your undoubtedly busy calendar.